Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Brass Junkies. I am joined. What am I? I'm Andrew Hitz. I usually say that, right? I think. And, uh, and I'm joined. Are you joined? <laughs> I'm joined by my co-host Lance LaDuke. I can't figure out the intro, even though it's has been unchanged for uh, years. And uh, Lance uh, w- didn't <laughs> fail to record his own audio last time when we recorded an intro, even though that setup has been unchanged for years. Lance, how are you? I'm good. I'm sporting my uh, IWBC t-shirt that my uh, awesome students brought back for me from this summer. And I'm very excited because... The week we're recording this in a couple of days from now, uh, the Amani Winds are coming to Pittsburgh, and I'm going to get to hang with them on Wednesday night, and they're coming to talk to my business and music class on Thursday morning. So I'm excited. How about that? Not bad, huh? Uh, that's not bad at all. So uh, so last time uh, we recorded, uh, which was last week, I had just, uh, just jammed with uh, John Fishman of Fish, uh, which was uh, obviously a very big deal in my life. Well... Lance LeDuc, guess what happened to me two days later? Um, you lost a tooth. No, oh. I did not lose it. That would, that would have sucked. Uh, no, I was playing with the Washington Chamber Orchestra uh, at this very fancy gala. And uh, there were uh, uh, like 20 people that got awards. And um, some of whom are some of my... Well, anyway, I digress. Uh, the uh, there was one person who has received this award in the past and who was a presenter, where they said uh, Jimmy Page is now going to come up and present an award, and I'm like, I'm sorry, what? Like <laughs> like dra- Dragon Pants Jimmy Page? Like there's more than one at a fancy gala. Anyway, this this gala was in the National Portrait Gallery uh, in uh, the room where Abraham Lincoln had his second presidential inaugural ball, like inaugural. I, I added a uh, syllable there. That was good. Um, is Gort- So we're like, there's like statues. There was exactly five feet between the statues and the back of the orchestra. And this is where all of the presenters were walking by. Like that included like Supreme Court justices and like former Israeli prime ministers and like I mean it was like place was swarming with earpieces. Well, Jimmy Page is walking right by me, like right by me, and the rest of them all had their heads down uh, and they were like waiting to go get seated. Did he on their way to get seated? He did. He did. He was like, "You're the guy that played with Fishman on Saturday." Uh, No, but he happened to be looking. I think he was trying to see what we were playing like on the music stand. And he looked right at me and in this stuffy gala. He's like, he's literally three feet from me as he's about to walk by in this stuffy gala while, while I'm wearing a tux and I got my tube on my lap. I flash him the devil horns and he lights up and he goes, yeah. and, then, <laughs> and then he walks by. And I was like, ah! So, yeah, man, Jimmy Page and I, after I hung with Fishman, um, yeah, my all time drumming idol, um, yeah, I. Jimmy Page is like in my top two uh, favorite guitarists of all time, and um, and we had a moment. So yeah, it was. Uh, and then he went and sat next to a sitting Supreme Court justice. It was very funny. Like that level <laughs> of society is like it's it's crazy, man. And we ain't in it. But uh, I was in it for a brief second, though. So yeah, he that was um, that was fun. And we played uh, with Denise Graves. Oh, cool! Which was spectacular. Oh my goodness! She did Habanera from Carmen, mm. and it was uh, it was god tier. Yeah, she's uh, she's remarkable. Yeah, so. she knows what she's doing. Yep, it turns out she does. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was, and then I saw Pearl Jam for the first time in 31 years uh, in Camden, which was incredible. And then I saw Medeski Martin and Wood for the first time in a few years, um, which is only my second time seeing them in the last <laughs> decade, in spite of seeing like 80 of their shows over the years. So it's been uh, it's been a week. There you go. Yeah, it's been a it's been a very good week. And now you so, get to talk to me. And now I get to talk to you. Look at that. Uh, our, All your uh, musical dreams are coming true. Our good friend Mike Jacobitz, uh, who he and I go way back, uh, Pearl Jam uh, closed their uh, their set with uh, with a tune that he really wanted to hear called Porch, and they really ripped it. And he like he flashed me the devil horns during during that tune and then between then and the encore i said you know how i know i'm having a better week than you are and he just got that smile on his face i said i said uh i got to flash devil horns at jimmy page you got to flash them at me (laughs) it's only once removed if you think of it that way (laughs) 
I did. I have been referring to my friends as my friend Jimmy Page. Mm -hmm. So, yep. Even even Buddy, because that's like you know that that implies like a, a you know an additional level of uh, familiarity and intimacy. So makes sense. Uh, yep, absolutely. So, all right, Lance, we've got our listeners' choice here. We've got um, we got questions. We got three questions to answer. Uh, but before we do that, we should probably. Thank Parker Mouthpieces for providing the hosting for the Brass Junkies. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, and tuba, including the Andrew Hitz Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece and the Lance LeDuc Model Euphonium Mouthpiece. You can find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I, I am trying to get him to uh, branch out to guitars to uh, maybe get a, a double neck guitar. Uh, they call mouthpiece. it the Jimmy. So, yeah. A guitar <laughs> mouthpiece. Yeah. I want two necks on my on my mouthpiece on mm -hmm. the next hits model mouthpiece. <laughs> oh, if you are if you're listening and not watching, first you're lucky. Second, yeah, that was uh, he was moving his mouth from left to right from different lead pipes. That was uh, that was quality. Um, yeah, double bell euphonium. That's easy. You yeah, know, like no double two mouthpieces. Mouth yeah, that's yeah, yeah, that's that's harder. Mm -hmm. All right, the first question. Let's let you go first here. Marcy in Noblesville, Indiana, wants to know, what do you think is the most common thing that is mistaught about brass playing? Hmm. That uh, you can make a living doing it? Well, there's that. <laughs> I mean, I would... The th first thing that came to mind, I think, uh, I hope, is changing, which is this jive talk about i mean there's like so much voodoo around breathing and i feel like went between between arnold jacobs and pat and sam i feel like we can kind of i personally feel like we can put that to rest now i i uh i can hear the um I understand that there are some differences <laughs> if you play high brass instruments versus low brass instruments, but the of respiratory course. system is the respiratory system and how you go about doing it and this notion of breathing from your diaphragm and from, you know, breathing from the bottom up. While they may be, I'll grant you, if you explain that those are merely um, just sort of uh, visualization devices. You don't mean them literally. You don't mean that you're going to flex, flex your diaphragm. Um, maybe, but there's just, why not just be anatomically correct and uh, uh, don't be like Ken. Be anatomically correct. <laughs> <laughs> there's some youngsters going, who the hell is Ken? Yeah, Ken who? Ken who? Yeah. I think Ken that's, Star, that's probably <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, that's somebody probably did, somebody it. just got mad at me and shut it off. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I my head goes to the exact same place where it's uh, it's breathing, uh, but but I'm I'm not. Um, I'm not I'm not as generous as you are in terms of like, you know, the breathing from the bottom up cuz I've seen like in terms of just using that as a and and you you said it with like a huge asterisk there. So, mm -hmm. um you were not endorsing that, but like I've seen that like uh manifest itself um, you know, in students by like they're like, you know, sticking their stomachs yeah. out like, you know, like where where it's um, you know, uh to breathe, uh, to breathe well, we need uh, the body needs to be able to move uh, in a free and easy manner, and that's why sitting or standing with good posture is important because it allows the the body to, whether it's your rib cage or you know, it, it allows everything to move out of the way so that your lungs can fill with air without being impeded, and um, and that you know that affectation is. Uh, you know, well, hinders that, you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it, uh, it hinders that. And it's just, it's something that's so incredibly simple that gets just overcomplicated, which, um, you know, to me, that's the equivalent of when you're in three lanes of traffic and there's like, you know, nonstop volume and it's like, everybody's driving like, you know, 55, uh, in, a, in a 65. So everybody's like a little annoyed that they're not going the, you know, 70, 75, like they planned. 
And if, you know, and, and I'll just like say get in the left lane. I usually stay out of the left lane in that situation because that usually starts and stops a lot faster mm-hmm. than the other ones do. But I stay put and then there's some, uh, you know, jackal who like, you know, changes lanes like 12 times and gets no further ahead than if they had just gone behind me and just stayed in one lane. That's to me what like complicating breathing is, which is just like unnecessary lane changes that don't even move you forward a little bit. Um, it's, uh, you know, at, yeah, and that's being, I think, generous, like, because I think sometimes that <laughs> that makes you move backwards in this analogy. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's all about simplifying, you know. Yeah. My fa- maybe my favorite Jacob's uh, breathing exercise that I saw him uh, do in a master class was if you just take your finger and you put your, your nail, like, press your index finger nail directly behind the, the the back of your top teeth and then just bring as much air as you possibly can to your fingertip and you just take like this gigantic breath and it just shows that if you get the air into your mouth that your body will take care of absolutely everything else and uh, I've seen a lot of it doesn't mean that if a student is doing something wrong breathing wise that you don't you just say stick your finger in your mouth and just breathe I mean uh, that's not you know same thing with embouchures right if somebody's got a great embouchure that <laughs> somebody's got a great embouchure that works then you don't talk about embouchure but if they have a problem with them then absolutely you talk about the corners you talk about the teeth you talk about all you know about you know being more relaxed and it's etc et right um, or more firm, uh, depending on where you're talking about and what their need is. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it feels like just there's a lot of teachers who will. And I think that you're right. I think it's starting to go away. But I think it feels like there's a lot of teachers who overcomplicate the teaching of breathing because that's how it was taught to them. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and that, I, I hope, will continue to uh, slowly wane. <laughs> Sorry, Wayne. Sorry, Ken. <laughs> Wayne Dumain mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and uh, and Ken Amos. There you go. There uh, it is. Apologies to uh, yep Ken Pope. I was like, yeah, there are uh, Wayne Bergeron. There are Ken there Drobnik. Are some, there are some Waynes and some Kens uh, mm-hmm. um, in our midst. Ken Sabaha. Uh, Ken... <laughs> what? <laughs> Wayne Connor. Yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a good name. I like that. We're entertaining way, only ourselves right now. <laughs> by the way. Jeff uh, just posted to Facebook that he just like he was posted from London that he was and, and I, I know that his son Jack is in college and I yeah. know that he's been there a few years but Third he year. just like just dropped him off for a uh, you know a semester abroad oh uh, that's you know, cool City College in London mm-hmm. where it's just like that's wild like I you know it doesn't seem like it was that long ago that I was asking Jeff every time we went back on the road like how's Carrie feeling when she was like seven months pregnant and. Uh, <laughs> Now he's like in a foreign country by himself with permission. Yeah. So it, uh, he's the same age as Duncan. I know. I know. Wait, yeah. so when did Jeff get there? Did he have something to do with the queen dying? <laughs> uh, hi. He was talking to her and she just faded away. Too soon? That's not nice. Sorry. That is not nice. Somebody else just. Who am I apologizing This game, he has. Uh, if you're unhappy with anything that has been said so far, uh, please email will at pedalopemedia.com. Uh, that is where all uh, that's where all complaints should go. Will at pedalnotemedia.com. Hi. Uh, would why don't you tell us about uh, about Duquesne? You know, the Mary Papert School at the Duquesne University in beautiful and sunny Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which you it know, is one of those things right now. It's a hellacious storm this morning. Um, Fantastic school of music, great uh, faculty that you can study uh, on each of the brass instruments with, and some really cool ensembles, and Pittsburgh's a cool town. And so come check it out, and uh, go on to the uh, uh, show notes and click on the link, and you can find out all the ways you can be involved with music at the Mary Pappert School of Music at Duquesne University. And a very, very special, warm, heartfelt thanks and um, extended appreciation to Jim Please clench my diaphragm, Nova, for making this possible. <laughs> not, no, not even not even clench his own, clench his own diaphragm. He wants no. someone else to clench yeah. his diaphragm for him. That's uh, that's, that's how, good. That's how much he cares. That's great. Speaking of Pittsburgh, did the Steelers play yesterday, or did they have a bye week? Oh yeah, I, I, they they lost to your team. <laughs> that's right. 
My team who played like garbage on both sides of the ball and still won. Oh, man. uh, I thought it was going to be much worse, to be honest. (laughs) So I was grateful it was close. (laughs) All right. Moving right along. Uh, Again, Steelers fans, uh, will at pedalnotemedia.com. Jag off. Peter Peter in San Jose, California. Mm, Not ugly. Says... What would you do differently if you had to go back and attend music school for the first time again? I'm going to let you answer that one first again because there's something I need to pull up. You mean personally? Yes. <laughs> um, I would... I mean, there's lots of like personal stupid... I was stupid and young things, but I, if this means like pedagogic or you know, like to change the trajectory of my musical development... Um, I probably, oh, it's tough because in my undergrad, I was, um, I played in every group that would have me. I was in the marching band, the wind ensemble, the, the Spartan brass, the tuba euphonium ensemble. I had a quartet at the same time. I was in the campus band playing tuba. Like I, I played, if there was a group that would let me into it, I play, so I was playing all the time, but it cut into my practicing. So, I mean, on the one hand, I, the easiest thing I would say I would, practice more but on the other hand by being able to be in all those ensembles it broadened my perspective of uh musical styles and playing in under different conductors and playing in different scenarios i guess the simple short answer go ahead uh, i just want to uh while it's still uh pertinent i want to interject that this especially goes for uh tuba players at uh, smaller schools is um, and now uh, there's going to be some directors who are going to be mad at me. Some college directors yeah. who will will at pedalnotemedia.com uh, that um, you have to defend your own time. And if you're at a school where there's not a lot of tuba players, especially if you're like the good one, you know, or one of the two good ones, they are going to want you to play in absolutely every single ensemble at the entire school. Uh, and if everything is scheduled out and you don't have time to practice and to explore and to learn how to be creative and to fail on your own, etc., but instead you're just in ensembles constantly where you're one of the best players in there, ensembles are really important, very valuable. You just said you got a lot out of it, but you have to be able to say no, and you'll get pushback. Like mm-hmm. You will get people who are mad at you, who are like faculty who will be mad at you, but hopefully your teacher will also have your back there, which is a little tricky. But um, yeah, so that's like especially for people like tuba players where, uh, you know, it, when the studio can be anywhere from like two to six people, right? Like if it's six, it's one thing. But if it's two, then they may try to load your plate so full that things are falling off. And uh, it's not going to be the, the, the rehearsals that are scheduled for you because you're not, you know, you got to show up, obviously. Mm-hmm. So defend your turf. So, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Continue. Well, and I try to be, I mean, even at, at CMU, I, I don't always have 100% participation from the euphoniums in the, in the Tartan Tuba band. Uh, I, I'd leave it up to, there's a, they have a chamber music requirement, but I think it's four semesters. Um, but once they've fulfilled that, and I don't care if they do them in a row or I, don't, I mean, they have to get those fulfilled and that's how the tubas and euphoniums uh, frequently get that. But if it's not a good fit for them for that semester or they have too much going on or it's overwhelming, oh, I don't want any parts of having them there. Being miserable is the other part. Like, I'm going to be right. there with one foot on the brake. Like, I don't need that. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the other yep. thing I would say, and it's the thing we've talked about a number of times, I would have learned to improvise. Full stop. I mean, that would, I think, have uh, really... That prob- that one skill, if I had learned that one skill, that probably would have impacted my career for the better. And I can't complain because I've been incredibly blessed. So I'm not, I'm not trying to take anything away from that. But I have to admit, I think that, would, uh, that could have opened even more doors. But I don't know. What it could have, should have. Yeah. Um, sorry, I, I had a, a link that I thought I had opened up, which, uh, which I hadn't, um, which uh, is now because I've written about this topic. Um, there are five things uh, specifically that I would um, do differently um, if I was a college student um, again. Uh, the first one is to uh, record myself significantly more, like significantly more. 
Um, the, the analogy that I like to use is that there is some, uh, you know, 85 year old in, uh, in Italy who is, uh, you know, has made tomato sauce from scratch. Um, never seen a recipe, learned it from their grandmother. Uh, you know, that they've, they've made it literally tens of thousands of times in their life. What's her name? What do they do? Every single time before they serve it, even if it's just to their spouse, they taste it, right? Because the tomato sauce, like with not enough salt, even with banging tomatoes and banging olive oil and banging garlic and banging, ba- it's like it. There's it's flat, and if there's too much salt, it's uh, you know it completely throws the whole thing out of whack. You taste it, right? So often, um, I did a lot of this where I was just like cooking, 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 and then I taste a little bit. <laughs> Like right before I'm about to serve it, mm-hmm. um, yeah, gotta record yourself um, a lot and get into a feedback loop. And if you're not used to doing that, I will, um, I will warn you that um, you're gonna get really bummed out when you first start doing that. Uh, but also look for one of my favorite Jacob's quotes is look, you know, catch yourself doing something right. And so listen for the things that are good uh, and the things that are improving, in addition to the things that are not. Um, and there's, there's even, sorry, go ahead. I think you should also, I mean, I was just talking about this with a student, <clears throat> um, have a set place that you, you know, if you can record in the same place with the microphone in the same place, you should do that. And then you should also be in that same room, but move the microphone somewhere else. So you get a different perspective of what it cool. sounds like. So you're not, maybe you're on the bell side, maybe you're not on the bell side, maybe it's behind you. Mm-hmm. And then mix up the rooms that you're in as well, just to kind of so have a constant, but then also, that's great. Uh, throw in a variable. Yeah, that's great. And you can actually tell a lot about uh, a lot about tone from recording just from your phone, but it's very specific what you can learn from it. Your tone is going to sound like crap. Like if you're a euphonium player, and you're going to compare your sound to Lance on the last Boston Brass album that he recorded. Uh, good luck because we flew to Phoenix to a specific church that we had chosen for its acoustics. We were paying uh, Clark Rigsby, who's like legendary recording engineer, and Sam Palafian to record and produce it. It's mixed, it's mastered. It's like you're not going to, there's no way Lance couldn't, would sound like crap on your phone. Um, you know, but so here's what you can tell is when your tone is not going to sound good but when it sounds different when it's like soft then you know it's a different bad then that means your tone is changing when you go into the lower you know like lower dynamics that's not ideal right or uh when there are certain notes where it changes like and so it could all sound bad but if some are different bad and you start to notice patterns then you realize that oh yeah d flats with two three and five uh you know are not i'm not in the center i'm like you know it's sharp and i'm lipping it down and it's just got that ah, you know sound to it and so you can learn a lot uh from that so even if it doesn't uh if it doesn't sound great um all right second thing is that i would take uh piano way more seriously uh, the first reason is just because it's required, whether you are an ass about it, like I was, um, or not. And I had never done anything with both hands, and I just didn't put in the time. And so it was like a constant source of uh, frustration for me because I sucked at the piano. Um, and uh, and so I wish that, and I can, you know, I got this for, you know. That's mm, I a, like that. It's my latest, uh, my latest tune. Um, you know, I've got that for teaching purposes and I can like bang out some chords and stuff. Um, but it would be great if I had just taken the two years of piano or almost two years of piano that I needed to take uh, a little bit more seriously because it would have, uh, a made things go smoother then and B, it just would be helpful now. Um, have I, the, have I ever told you the story on here? This might be a good bonus episode thing. I can't remember if I've talked about the dead animals. You have not, and that is a perfect thing for the bonus episode. It's a that is band going to that be. we had That's... in our uh, college years. Okay, uh, no, that is uh, <laughs> you've. I I've never heard that in the van uh, on the podcast. <laughs> like I would, uh, I would remember a story about a band called the Dead Animals. Yep, um, that's spectacular. Um, number three is that I would take notes at every master class and after every single lesson. Um, I do that now when I attend a, a master class anywhere, I bring my laptop and I'm like banging out notes and banging out quotes. And I, I used to, uh, before uh, procreating, I used to attend a lot more master classes. 
and I would go and I would like I'm I'm a fast typer. I would type a list of quotes. I would then take that list and some of it wouldn't make sense without the context of what was happening in the moment. So I would remove those. I would then, uh, you know, edit it. I would then take the ones that were really great and put them in bold. So I'm like, I'm reading these like four or five times. I would then post it to uh, andrewhits.com to my blog there. And by the time I did that, I was, I had like, I had internalized like all of the main points from that class. And that whole process took me like, an hour uh, and just like being super attentive while I was there and then another hour. Uh, and then it was like, that stuff was integrated into my teaching, like by that week. Um, do that when you're in school, do that, do that, do that. It's uh, yeah, it's really, really uh, helpful. And by the way, um, you know, Sam used to talk uh, about um, the most important lesson of the week is not the, excuse me, <laughs> most important lesson of the week is the one that you have. The most, um, the most important practice session of the week is not the one right before your lesson. It's the one right afterwards. And it should ideally be the same day, um, which in general, you got like a week to learn your assignment. You know, it's like that's the day you're going to like, you know, maybe chill, you know, like on, uh, on practicing again that day because you've already had your lesson. That's the day to like really apply and to, you know, to really uh, get ingrained all the stuff that you just learned. Two more. Uh, one is I would play a lot more chamber music. Mm. Make it up make up the ensemble uh figure it out uh or play you know play standard standard rep right play standard brass quintet with two trumpets horn trombone tuba whatever it can be creative it could not but um it's really amazing even if you play a you know trumpet or an instrument where you're making a lot more creative decisions uh you know if you're playing trumpet in orchestra your principal trumpet is making some decisions for the brass section um tuba is not um, but even trumpet, you're making way more decisions, both individually and collectively. It's just, it's, uh, you know, it's invaluable. And then uh, the last one uh, is uh, to regularly attend master classes and recitals of other studios. Um, so when there's a clarinet player that comes to town, um, you know, who's like some like guest artist who's there for three days, there's a very good chance that that person is a big deal or else they wouldn't be coming to your school for three days out of all of the clarinet players that the professor there could hire. Uh, go. Go to the master class. Go to the recital. Uh, pay attention. Take notes. Do all that stuff because there are things that are easy on the clarinet. A good high school clarinet player can play a diminuendo better than either of us can. <laughs> And you've got great soft chops uh, when um, I played in a rock band yesterday. So today it would be a little challenging. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, like we can both play real soft. and a, But but clarinet is just what, keeping that reed, uh, particularly on a clarinet, vibrating at ridiculously low volumes is apparently much easier than uh, most other instruments. Because <laughs> judging by the fact that like a good, again, a good, not amazing high school clarinet player can just kill that. Um, and so... They don't care that it's hard to play that soft. So you, you go and see that, and it's like, okay, well, now now that's your problem. You play the trombone, figure out how to integrate that kind of... As Sam used to say, the, our number one tool as musical storytellers is dynamics, our dynamics. And, um, and you know, the uh, I didn't want to quote him with uh, bad grammar because he actually used to say it correctly, But um, although he's not here to fight back. So, yeah, he said is dynamics. Um, anyway, any uh, anything else on that topic? I don't think so. That was way more thorough than I thought we would be. That's good. That's yeah, man. That's accidentally. We we might. That might be useful. <laughs> Sorry. And the Steelers fans will never hear it. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, that's a yeah. that's a real shame. Yep. So yep. Uh, as will uh, anyone who hates Led Zeppelin. So um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know what, Andrew? What, what, Lance? Houghton Horns aims to spread the joy of music through providing the highest level of product, well, services, and resources to the brass playing community. They have free domestic shipping on all new items, excluding sheet music, and free domestic returns on new instruments and mouthpieces when you order online at HoughtonHorns.com. They stock the finest makes of brass instruments, including Bach, Con Selmer, Eastman & Shires, Engelbert Schmidt, Paxman Tyne, and Yamaha, among many others. They do repairs and customizations in-house. They have free equipment consultations in person or virtual uh, available with their team of professional musicians. You can schedule yours at HoughtonHorns.com. You can watch over 200 unique videos at Houghton Horns uh, YouTube channel, uh, YouTube.com Houghton Horns. And if you enter the promo code JUNKIES at online checkout, you receive 10% off your purchase from HoughtonHorns.com. Some limitations apply. 
Thank you, Lance, no, for, no. The, uh, Thank for, the, you. for the dramatic reading. Uh, all right. Dave in Bowie, Maryland. Bowie. Hey, there you go. Would Remember like the Bowie know. Brass Quintet? Did you ever hear those guys? I don't think so. It was a bunch of, well, the Badger was in it. Marty okay. Erickson was in it. Um, oh. I don't remember. I'm forgetting on the Bob. Uh, da, 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 da. They were a really good uh, uh, quintet, local, you know, all military band folks. I guess they did some that really nice a, stuff. Yeah, those are two uh, two pretty decent uh, folks right there. Yep. Yeah, Marty and the Badger. Marty and the um, Badger. Do, 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 do. <laughs> One is Marty. The other is a Badger. <laughs> the, so the the let's. Uh, it's been a long time since we talked about uh, about the Badger. So the Badger uh, was the nickname of Chris Matten, who was a uh, bass trombonist, um, who was uh, awesome. Uh, and he was, uh, what was his role? He was your supervising Yeah, he got officer? into the military the in the, he actually joined the, the military into the Bicentennial Band. There was a Bicentennial Band for the two years of surrounding the Bicentennial. Brian Bowman actually was in it. Chris Matten oh, was in it, yeah. I didn't know and that. And then he went into the uh, Air Force Band. And he, when I got in the Air Force Band, he was my supervisor. That's that was it. And so he, I, he, yeah, he had to deal with me, and I him. Um, I just tormented him constantly. But our kids grew up together. Like we, it was really. I mean, he was one of my dearest friends and mentors. Uh, but yeah, I drove him crazy in rehearsals. <laughs> <laughs> He, so the Badger recorded, uh, you know, we've, yeah, we've told this story, but we've been doing this for so long. There's like a, there, there are, there are some of these stories. There are people who have yeah. listened to every episode for th four years mm -hmm. and who are like, yeah, I've never heard that. Uh, cause yeah, we're almost at episode 200. We, he recorded the, the recording engineer, fantastic recording engineer <clears throat> for, um, the brass recording project album that we did. The, uh, the, the arrangements of, uh, JD Shaw. And um, he was, uh, we did this, recorded this at the Landon School. Uh, shout out to Earl Jackson. Um, that, uh, you know, he was in like in a booth at the back of the, of the auditorium. And, uh, and we would, uh, <laughs> we would be <laughs> screwing around so much. <laughs> the recording session was going so well. How well uh, was that, it going? That's uh, Rich Kelly, Kevin Jebo, JD, Lance, and myself. And um, we were just plowing through these tunes to the point where we handed out new charts that uh, Rich and Kevin had never played before. And like there was like, yeah, it was like, a, what, what? Which tune was it that um, that that they? There was one tune like hard trumpet parts. And I was yeah. like, oh, this is pretty straightforward. The tune that you sang. What was the the jazz all right. tune that you sang? It's all right with me. Yeah, it's all right with me. Yes. That was it. And uh, I was like, oh, yeah, it's straightforward. You know, I'm thinking, like, there's no tempo changes. There's no, you know. And then I, I forgot, like, in the middle. There's like, yeah, there's, like, there's like some real intro. I was like, oh, yeah, except for that. They're both glaring at me like, you dumbass. Like, this is not easy. <laughs> and um, You can hear that two, album, actually. You can hear the yep. product of that. Yes, you can. Yep, streams uh, streams everywhere. If you want, actually want to give us money, you can buy it. But nobody really does that anymore. <laughs> um, the, uh, you, uh, so... I remember the two of them were like, can we have like 10 minutes? And I'm like, sure. And then they like each like just noodled for like five minutes. And then like, and then they were like, okay, we're ready. And then just recorded. And I was like, oh, okay. They're, like I said, it's easy. Um, yeah, I lied, but they made me look like I hadn't lied. But it was going so well that we were so loose. We were just screwing around, which like, that's chicken or an egg thing, right? Like, mm -hmm. is it going so well because you're loose or are you loose because it's going so well? It's kind of like, yes is the answer on recording sessions. And because uh, we've both been on recording sessions that have not been going that well before, and it's not loose, mm -hmm. <laughs> so. And um, but we were um, we were trying to see. <laughs> there were times when he was like, he was tracking it, so he would say, "Okay, this is you know take uh, you know thirty seven for whatever you know like measure blot to blot, and then go, and then we would just like you know we'd we'd still be talking, and then we would just stop, and then we would just wait for him to like prairie dog, like he would just like. <laughs> You just like he'd rise like because it would be like you wouldn't do that two seconds it'd be like fifteen seconds and then <laughs> and then one of us would be like oh just let us know when you're ready he's like I'm ready <laughs> slow mo whack a badger <laughs> oh man that was um, and he couldn't get mad because it was going so well yeah even though he knew that we were doing it on purpose like yeah that was um, he was, was easy to 
get stirred up. Yes, yes. And which, always which, worth it. Which you'd think that we would have felt bad, but um, turns out that was not my experience. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun uh, fun recording session. Yeah, it was. And not just because there was like a 16th of an inch of snow and uh, Jibo's uh, sports car couldn't get up a, a hill that had like a... That, yeah. that had about like... Gained like about berm. four inches of elevation over, yeah, over like an eighth of a mile. So that was... Uh, and do you remember how we helped him right away? No, oh, that's yeah. right. We pulled out the phone and videoed it and mm -hmm. laughed. Yeah, that, that was helpful. Was, uh, to us. <laughs> He, um, I remember him, uh, remember him, uh, telling us that we were number one. I remember I the, thought that the, too. Yeah. 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 There was a, uh, you're a number one salute, which mm -hmm. I, which I appreciated, you know, like, <laughs> cause he was struggling and he still took the time to tell me how much I meant to him. So reminds me, you know, this uh, Jimmy Carter quote, I'm going to, uh, it'll, it, it's a close, uh, approximation of it, but he said, the thing that I noticed the most after being out of office is that now when people wave at me, they use all their fingers. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. No, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So Dave and Bowie says, uh, if you could make any musician perform in a genre they've never played before, who and what would it be? <laughs> the first thing I thought of was Yo-Yo Ma rapping. That's funny. I thought about that, too. Because he's got great <clears throat> style. He's got great ear. You know, like, yeah. it'd be, Yeah. But that would be uh, that. That was my first, and then my still kind of funny, but um, but but uh, but also serious is like any mean conductor, make them solo in front of a major orchestra. Ooh, that's pretty good, <laughs> right? Like any mean conductor, of which I could name some uh, that are quite famous right now. Um, that um, that uh, never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity to lift people up in the orchestra, especially like when they're the music director, <laughs> and then just make them like, "What's your instrument? Oh, it's flute. Okay, good. Yeah, go ahead, play Mozart. Yeah, we'll, we're good. <laughs> you just tell us the tempo, yeah, and then we'll, and then we'll do this." So that that I think that would be my my answer. I won't I won't name names because I don't want to I don't want to stir it up too bad. But um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> um, I was thinking, well, the, one of the things that I thought was that I would put you in a Steely Dan cover band. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't technically a genre. Um, <laughs> um, I also thought about... <laughs> hey, hold on. Before, before, people, before Steely Dan fans uh, email <laughs> me... Uh, We're Will at, never made it today. Will at pedalopemedia.com. Um, I respect the hell out of Steely Dan. Um, there's just like the, you know, like the most important part of music is like that, like you can't put your finger on it, like for whatever reason. And I've tried many times. My life would be easier if I liked Steely Dan because there are some people who really like them and are not okay with the fact that I don't like them. My life would be easier if I did, but I just, I, the, that, that thing you can't put your finger on, completely absent from their music for me. It's just, I've looked, I've looked and I've looked. And I've looked, and uh, I just can't find it. So, um, yeah. So, anyway, I mean, like, you know, Steve Gadd is playing on some of those. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, you know, he's like one of my heroes. I mean, you know, it's like I, I've, and, and it's it's brilliant writing and the harmony. I mean, it's like, it's great. I just, uh, I when I saw uh, Medeski, Martin, and Wood on Saturday, there were four, four bands. The opening band um, uh, was a, a band called Cool Cool Cool. It was their first ever gig. They were actually quite good. Uh, they closed. They closed with a Fleetwood Mac tune, <laughs> which um, which is funny because they covered Sly and the Family Stone two tunes before that, which in general is a really bad idea. Like that's a that's good music to sound like you don't know what the hell you're doing pretty quickly, <laughs> and they absolutely crushed it. Mm. Like crushed it, and so closer was a little uh, yeah. Mike Jacobitz, who I was with, turned and just started laughing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Because the, uh, the the Phoenix, when he and I used to work at a mailbox, et cetera, now it's the UPS store. But this is a mom and pop version of that. Um, and uh, the classic rock station in Phoenix was like was shockingly bad. It was like shockingly bad what they played and what they didn't play. And somebody in Fleetwood Mac is from Phoenix. Mm. So they used to play Fleetwood Mac like all the time. Speaking of Jimmy Page, too. We had a... They used to accept, this is, how, this is how long ago this was, they used to accept fax requests, right? Like you could call or fax. <laughs> we had, next to the fax machine at this place, we had a handwritten fax that I had written out 
that said, uh, play more Led Zeppelin and for the love of God, no more Fleetwood Mac. And I, fa I faxed that to them every single time that I, <laughs> that, I, that I was working at noon. So they, like some, some idiot at that station got that over. And of course I knew it wasn't going to work. They never played Zeppelin during that hour and they played Fleetwood Mac like half of the time. It was probably because of my fax, but it was like, it was just funny. Just like, and, and people knew not to throw it away. It would just sit next to the fax machine. So. <laughs> There's, uh, yeah, there's my story. So anyway, me and a Fleetwood Mac uh, cover band. I like that. Or, sorry, uh, Steely, Steely Dan, Dan cover band. Yep. I mean, the other things that come to mind, I guess it's less genre, but I <clears throat> see, I've always been drawn to that stuff. There were a couple of records like in the 90s, I want to say. There was like a album of Kurt Vile music that was like all done by different artists. And it's, I've always just been a fan of people doing weird stuff, to think, stuff that you think that you know. Like, have you heard mm -hmm. the Flaming Lips, Sergeant Pepper thing? No. That's pretty interesting. Cheap Trick cool. covered Sergeant Pepper live, which was cool. Um, there's mm. this band that uh, not a ton of people know, Me First and the Gimme Gimmies, who are, um, they're West Coast. Um, if, if I have my story straight, which I may not, it's from what I gathered, it's a bunch of guys from, they've been around for tw 20 plus years. Actually, I'm not sure how recently they've been recording but it's all these guys who were in a variety of punk bands and they came together and they only played cover tunes and so then they did like show tunes and then they did country music and then they did like beach boys esque you know like that kind of that they would pick a period and they would like just do these covers and they were both hilarious because it was like delta dawn at mach 7 <clears throat> um but they were also expert musicians so like the drummer is out of his mind the guitar player the bass player like everybody is just completely killing it so to have them tackle i don't know what would be interesting like uh an opera would be kind of freaking cool i mean it's yeah. it's just a complete mashup of uh, they're expert musicians and then take on this style that they're not familiar with but like i like that i mean i was thinking about elvis costello already does that joe jackson already does that like the people that i'm drawn to they all do weird Matt Peter Gabriel, you know. They, Fish does that. Fish. Yeah. So yep. there's these two Peter Gabriel tunes, or, I'm sorry, albums that were I can't remember what they're called, but they're. <clears throat> uh, I know which ones you mean. The one yeah. one of them he did all these covers of mm -hmm. of singer songwriters that he dug, and the mm -hmm. other one he had all those singer songwriters that he dug his cover tunes. one of his tunes. Yeah. And they were orchestrated like it was with this yep. kind of modified symphony orchestra. This that stuff is cool. really interesting to me. Yeah, so yeah, that's that where my head goes. Uh, are, <coughs> did you ever hear the uh, the Judgment Night soundtrack? That was a 1993 mm -hmm. film. Um, the uh, the whole album. It's one of my favorite. Um, it's easily one of my favorite soundtracks uh, to a movie. Um, uh, paired uh, a hip hop artist mm. with. Um, it wasn't all like heavy metal, but it was like you know hard rock and so like helmet and house of pain teenage fan club and de la soul living color and run dmc biohazard and onyx slayer and ice t which is spectacular uh faith no more and booyah tribe sonic youth and cypress hill uh which is amazing mud honey and sir mix a lot like <laughs> these are like you know you just hear the, and it's it's awesome dinosaur jr and del the funky homo sapien Therapy and Fatal and Pearl Jam and Cypress Hill, mm. and it's like it's it's spectacular. Yeah, it's uh, some of those tunes are good, uh, and most of them are great, and a few are just like stunningly awesome. So yeah, but I I dig it. You know, it's like it's this like, you know, it's like the the heavy thing, but then with the rap, and so it's mm -hmm. like it's more groove based for. So both of them are a little bit out of their comfort zones, if you will. Um, but they all, yeah, it's, uh, I, I dig stuff like that. There's so. two more albums that come to mind <clears throat> that are exemplars of this. Did you see the movie Life Aquatic? It's a Wes Anderson movie. Bill Murray is in it, and it's that kind of usual cast of characters. And it's sort of a take on Jacques Cousteau's story. And, um, but there's this Brazilian guitar player and singer-songwriter whose name is Sue Jorge, who's just incredible. I mean, an amazing singer-songwriter. But if you are... 
if you don't if you're not familiar with Wes Anderson movies, they're all a little peculiar and they all have a very distinctive look and style. And so about every six or seven minutes throughout this movie, Sue George would show up someplace and start playing an acoustic guitar um, and singing a David Bowie tune. And it had nothing to do with the movie. <laughs> it had nothing to do with what was going on in the scene. It was just sort of these transitions. And so then they released this whole album of them. And he was in just very weird places on this boat and uh, was recording these tunes. And they're just beautiful and haunting. And they're all in Portuguese. Um, but really, really cool. And then the other one uh, that, that just when you were talking about that last album, have you heard Eddie Vedder's ukulele record? Yes. So good. Yeah. And his approach to the instrument is so different. It's, it's really a, a, a super cool thing. He's a brilliant musician. Yeah. He really is. Yeah, he's been Letterman uh, all the time. Letterman loved him, man. Yeah, he's, he's a brilliant musician. Yeah, and, and one, the, the, the musicians I look up to in the business are the people who, um, who don't, don't stop, you know, they keep their feet moving, you mm -hmm. know, where it's like they don't just, um, you know, I, I don't know. You could easily make your living as a euphonium now, just going around the country and like you know playing recitals with pantomime on it um, and playing the absolute crap out of it. And there'd be value there, by the way. There'd be like a lot of people that would be very excited to hear that, and that would be inspirational to students who are trying to learn it, etc. Um, but that would like eat you alive. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> like I mean, it would. It would just, and that, uh, and that's not to say that somebody who that doesn't eat alive uh, should change or be more like. Like, there's no value judgment there, hmm. um, uh, none. Uh, genuinely, I'm not just saying that to to not sound like an you know an a hole. Um, yeah. Uh, that <laughs> will at pedalnotemedia.com. Uh, no, it's just you know like that would that would completely, yeah, that would eat you up. So yeah. um, well, my yeah, whole not, bag is you should just you should make the music that nobody else is doing. Yeah. So yep. that's just, there's too many people who care about that music more than I do and they should go do that. Yeah. That's, that's a, yeah. It, if I don't have something new to say, then I don't know why I need to say it. Cause it's also like, since I don't live in that world, like constantly, it's a lot of work to work up a, mm -hmm. you know, like piece of major lit that if you haven't played it before. Um, and then like, for what, you know, like for what, like, I, you know, I mean, I, yeah, playing with uh, with John Butte's band, Butte and Friends. Now it's like you know I'm I'm hopping between yesterday. So some of the charts came in late for the gig that we had yesterday afternoon uh, here in D.C. And there was like a you know there was a couple of tunes where I was playing the bass line um, that I had never even heard before. You know, so I'm like, and there was no rehearsal beforehand um, for this gig, um, and the band had played some of them. But you know, so I'm like. I like listened once on YouTube and then like I'm on stage and I'm like, I'm playing the bass line, you know, um, and like that's, that's good for me. Mm -hmm. Like that's, um, yeah, that's, that's good for me. And talk about, you know, it was a, it was like an afternoon gig at a brewery and there was a, there was an audience, like there was like people that came to hear the band and they were digging and there was like people dancing. It was like, it's not like we weren't background music, but it was also like, you know, not exactly the kind of gig. I've played some Dixie gigs with some like crusty old dudes mm -hmm. who like if you like, you know, miss the bridge, they're kinda like you know, they're like they're like, you know, will physically turn fifteen degrees to like look at you, be like, <laughs> Are you lost? You know, like which is like fine, because it's like, you know, anytime I've done that, I've like I've been a sub on their gig, so mm -hmm. like you can treat it that way. Um but this was like low stress, right? Like so and yet it was it was the good kind of stress because it was the, what Seth Godin calls tension, you know, which is when you don't know whether it's going to go well or not go well, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this episode, which we had to put some thought into the the awesome questions, etc. But like, there's no tension here for either you or I. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we do our thing. There are just some my diaphragm, that, but right. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no tension in this. There was tension in the beginning. Right, you know, like where mm -hmm. we just we didn't know how to open, we didn't know how to close, you know, we just like, yeah. Before the for anybody who's trying to start something, we'll maybe uh, close with this here. Maybe who's trying to start something before we started all this, we did not decide like, okay, like uh, which one of us should uh, should like kick it off every time, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, Andrew's the best reason for best person for that because blank, you know, like it just kind of it just went developed. that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just developed. And then, like, the whole, uh, how you know, how are you? Like, mm -hmm. it just kind of develops, you know. But you can't develop something without 
developing it. <laughs> whoa, <laughs> you know, like, wait, 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 there's, whoa. There's a process. You know, you can't compare, um, you know, your work in progress to someone else's finished product, which is funny because some people, this is the first episode, and they're like, this is your finished product. <laughs> 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 yes, in fact, it is, which, yep, it commentary. <laughs> appropriate and encouraged uh, are these numbered wrong have you done 198 of these before this one <laughs> <laughs> like, like, at no point you guys were like maybe we should stop yeah <laughs> oh, anyway uh will at pedalotemedia.com mm -hmm. uh all right lance is there anything else no I <laughs> god no <laughs> That's the other thing that has uh, that has changed because you used to like make up something ridiculous. Oh, yeah, <laughs> remember back? I, I used now to talk go, about the no. interns. I had a whole thing about the interns. Oh, they uh, couldn't be on the call because they Austin were Austin and Buddy. That's yeah, right. man. Yeah, 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 who are now like both. Yeah, like Buddy's like Doctor Buddy. <laughs> Doctor Buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Doctor Buddy. Doctor, like. Yeah, he played in Dallas Brass for a number of years and then retired from Dallas Brass. It's like, and now he's a doctor, and now mm -hmm. he has a college job, and yeah. Austin's uh, Austin's kicking butt in uh, in Boston. Yeah. So yeah, we um, yeah we we you know we flouted some child labor laws, but yeah, they were working for us when they were like eleven, twelve. Yeah. So yeah, they were uh, they were malleable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to play the trumpet. Goodness. Yeah. <laughs> No. I bet you do. <laughs> Edit these audio files first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and no playing outside with your friends until this is done. Mm -hmm. There, Dr. Buddy. All right. Well, um, if you are a... Uh, I'm about to hear a story, uh, a Lance story. There still are Lance stories that I've never heard, and there still are uh, some stories that Lance has never heard. Um, I've heard most of his stories. He's heard most of my stories like nine mm -hmm. times. But uh, the but we're about to hear about the dead animals, which yep. is um, wild. That is for our Patreon patrons. <laughs> uh, if you go to uh, which, like, believe it or not, like in my head, I was like, this is going to be a value. You know, the, this is going to be a this is the value proposition. Is if you support the show, which the main thing, by the way, is like we just got to keep this thing going, and it's a ton of work, and it's expensive, and um, yeah, it's a lot of ongoing costs. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts to everyone who has. Um, who continues to help us. Uh, although, if you are a listener and you can't afford uh, even just a little bit of money, to uh, like, we are happy you're here. So, um, yeah, we'd rather have you here uh, than your money. Um, although both is great, but, uh, but we would genuinely rather have you here. Uh, but we're about to hear about the dead animals, which, uh, which I'm pretty excited about. That's pretty so exciting. That's, that's going to be pretty good. Uh, all right. Well, Lance, uh, this was wonderful. Um, yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed your shirt, at least. Thank you. And uh, that is going to do it for this episode of The Brass Junkies. You've been listening to The Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to hear the bonus episode featuring today's guest, please visit patreon.com slash thebrassjunkies to learn how you can support the show and instantly access all bonus materials as well as gain access to a special patron-only Facebook group. The Brass Junkies is produced by the amazing, wonderful, and truly inspirational Will Houchen. The theme music was composed by Fernando Dados and performed by Andrew Hitz and Lance Ledoux. Duke. We are at Pray for Yens on Twitter and Instagram and have a Facebook page at facebook.com slash pray for Yens. You can find out more about the Brass Junkies and all the other Pedal Note Media podcasts at pedalnotemedia.com. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. <laughs>